I tell you, Marnie, I've been up in that room looking out those windows every night here, and just thinking it's just one story. The oldest. Oh, Jack. Light versus dark. Here's to me that the dark has a lot more territory. In that final metaphor, it's an earnest urge to merge the secular with the sacred. There was darkness, and the Lord said unto the darkness, let there be light. Is, is someone struggling, not even struggling, just wondering? Yeah. Is, is, is there some kind of metaphor that, that takes it all in? Yeah. Well, what's the story about it? It's very basal level, light versus dark. And then when you consider, well, wait a minute, once upon a time, it was all a void. And now there's lights exploding everywhere. Yeah. It's, it's, it's almost full, you know, and, and they just keep coming, these stars, they just right. keep coming. If you've not already seen True Detective Season 1, this video is an in-depth study of the themes throughout that season. This is a fair warning, there will be spoilers ahead. Now the story of True Detective Season 1 is steeped in references from H.P. Lovecraft writings, as well as a host of other religious and archetypal themes. The main character presents his criticism of religion as a whole, as well as of specific denominations within evangelicalism. These names are directly linked to the H.P. Lovecraft character, The King in Yellow, inspired by Robert W. Chambers' 1895 book. Since I have not seen an in-depth analytical video study on the relationship between Lovecraft lore and this show, I have decided to take a shot at it. The first aesthetic or narrative similarity that I noticed was the detective's resemblance to many of Lovecraft's main protagonists. Rust Cole is basically a mirror of many of Lovecraft's lead characters, in that he's searching for clues or evidence to unravel a great mystery. Much like them, he discovers the supernatural and spiritual elements of the mystery closer to the finale. He is also accused of being crazy and insane because of his obsessive and eccentric nature, as well as his dedication to solving the old case. Marty is a fantastic character, don't get me wrong, he has great depth and detail, but he does primarily act as a supplemental tag-along guide in the story. Oh, I was just a regular type dude. Rust is the prime mover. The second similarity is an artistic and thematic one. Several times throughout the season, the idea of face removal is mentioned. Rust tells Marty the story of his time in a narcotics division where the penalty for betrayal was to watch in a mirror as your face was sliced and peeled off. The second, inside of Carcosa, when Childress has him overpowered, he says, Take off your mask. He also refers to Cole as Little Priest and there seems to be some kind of familiarity between Rust and Cole and the forces behind the idea of the Yellow King. The goal of this video is not to give any sense of validity or credence to the philosophy behind Carcosa or the King in Yellow. These are occult beliefs and they are ultimately dangerous. However, I believe they should be studied. The goal of this video is to determine the full origins of the mythos of the King in Yellow, where he sits in the hierarchy of the Elder Gods, what his intentions are for our world, how he usually executes those intentions, and how his throne is directly connected to ancient sacrificial practices. Now going back to Chambers, The King in Yellow, we find four stories that begin the collection and deal in some way with the accursed yellow sign, which is said to produce hypnosis or possession by The King in Yellow. About 25 years later, these ideas inspired H.P. Lovecraft to incorporate The King in Yellow entity into his Cthulhu mythos. Under his pen, the demonic king took on several appearances, all equally terrifying. The first. Haster has been described many ways, but was vividly and most effectively portrayed as a patron of shepherds in Ambrose Bierce's short story, Hyata the Shepherd. 
One of the most poignant and poetic lines from the story may also have a deep connection to Nick Pizzolatto's screenplay. <sighs> she, uh... When, so he reasoned, he must have been small and helpless like a lamb. It was through thinking on these mysteries and marvels, and on that horrible change to silence and decay, which he felt sure must some time come to him, as he had seen it come to so many of his flock, as it came to all living things except the birds, that Hyeta first became conscious how miserable and hopeless was his lot. It is necessary, he said, that I know whence and how I came, for how can one perform his duties unless able to judge what they are by the way in which he was entrusted with them? And what contentment can I have when I know not how long it is going to last? Perhaps before another son I may be changed, and then what will become of the sheep? What indeed will have become of me? Rust's interview takes place over several hours, but is dispersed across the first seven episodes in a slow-burning sort of orchestra. The interlude takes place when the two men ask him basic questions, the middle part and the body of the piece contain his philosophical and interdimensional comments where he feigns a buzz from the Lone Star beer. The crescendo is when the two detectives start to redirect some of that darkness back onto Cole in a maneuver that was intended to pin him in the hotbox and potentially build the narrative against him. The way Cole gets a read on the new guys is subtle, but you can see him working if you close in on his eyes and contextualize his rambling within the murder case. For Detective Cole, the act of being analyzed is a two-way street. Information is given, but most of it isn't groundbreaking or anything beyond what his contemporaries know. Every moment in the room is a form of an inverted interrogation, where the interrogators are flipped on themselves. Much of the philosophy emanating from Cole's personal experiences and perceptions on the world are steeped in the ideas of Arthur Schopenhauer, as well as Thomas Ligotti's The Conspiracy Against the Human Race. The outlook paints a dark and grim picture of the world, while its personification in Rust Cole captures and builds the true detective story. While not a case of blatant plagiarism, the fictional character's thoughts appear to lean so heavily on said ideas as to indicate a specific intention. The sacred meets the secular. The girl, she hadn't been reported yet. Uh, she was from St. Landry. Catatonic when we found her. I don't want to know anything anymore. This is a world where nothing is solved. If someone once told me time is a flat circle, everything we have done or will do, we're going to do over and over and over again. And that little boy and that little girl, they can be in their room again. feeling that you might notice it sometime this feeling like life has slipped through your fingers like the future's behind you like like it's always been behind you. remember what i said about the detective's curse Solution, my whole life was right under my nose. That woman, those kids. I was watching everything else. The marriage of these elements is probably what pulled me in the most, yet it is interestingly one of the most theologically problematic parts of the show. Cole is a misanthrope who ostensibly engineers his own moral code outside the dogmas of organized religion and secular humanism, yet his actions are almost undeniably that of a man who cares. He answers Marty's question about how do you get out of bed in the morning with a two-edged reply. He says I like the constitution for suicide, but the real answer is it's obviously programming. 
The entire show from beginning to end is based on these two men uncovering the mystery behind the occult murder so that they can save innocent lives and avenge the lives already lost. They are facing darkness and evil head on in order to right wrongs. Their lives suffer for this. Despite everything Rust says, his actions speak of a man who recognizes the purely destructive nature of evil in the world. Something in him wants to stop the crimes and correct the cycle of conscious perversion of the innocence. I think most of that stems from his daughter and failed marriage. None of this is ever said explicitly, but it would seem from the entire basis of the story that he does care about some people and some ideas. He certainly values his own ideas and the idea that the murder case is worth solving. If not, the story could practically be reduced to a man without meaning or purpose, set on doing random things for random people in order to get a paycheck. But we know 100% beyond a doubt that it is not because of the money or the status. He voluntarily gives up these things in order to continue pursuing the case incognito. The strange dichotomy in Rust is that, although he expresses nihilistic ideas and denies the validity of Christian teachings, his will and desire seem to point to an ideal, meaning that his instincts and behavior seem to have both a purpose and a direction. His actions can also be compared symbolically to King David and in some ways to Solomon for his eyes are not consumed with or fixed on human ideals. They focus instead on the patterns of reality set before him. Shining light on the darkness of man. If you pay attention to the clues, there is a subtext about our main characters hidden inside the cosmicism. This is where all of the character and theme details that I just mentioned converge beautifully. Each one is an artifact of a higher existence in the embedded Lovecraft mythos. Like Rust says, everything outside our dimension, that's eternity. Eternity looking down on us. Now, to us, it's a sphere, but to them, it's a circle. Notice his wording, them. He goes on to say, in eternity where there is no time, nothing can grow, nothing can become nothing changes. So, death created time to grow the things that it would kill. You can't remember your lives. You can't change your lives. And that is the terrible and secret fate of all life. You're trapped by that nightmare you keep waking up into. To realize that all your life not all your love, all your hate, all your memory, all your pain, it was all the same thing. It was all the same dream. A dream that you had inside a locked room. A dream about being a person.